I'm so glad to be here this morning, um, but I was really glad to be away this weekend as well with the men of Evangel Church. You saw that picture of them. Uh, man, almost 60 men went away for a retreat to get away and press into God. And I'm going to tell you, it was a different kind of retreat. I could feel it from the first moments that worship began on Friday night that God was up to something. God was up to something very distinct, very different. I felt that God moved in very, a very powerful way through each of our sessions. I see a few of the people that were at the retreat even here with us uh, today. Uh, I think they'll testify as well. God met us up there on that mountain, and uh, I believe men are coming back. Ladies, get ready. Families, get ready. I believe these men have had an encounter with the Lord that's going to leave them different. And can we just celebrate that? Can we celebrate when the Lord does that? Let me tell you, I believe one of the things that made the difference we had our guest speaker, Pastor Jermel, with us, and he, he, he's spoken a lot. He's traveled a lot. He said, I feel so nervous when he got up to speak to our men because he said, I could feel the presence of God so strong in this place. And he, and he just knew, and, and God just met us that night. And he kept asking me, he said, Pastor Chris, what's going on at your church? What's happening? I could feel it. I could feel it in the hearts of the people there. And I said, we're praying, Pastor Jamel. I said, we've turned our hearts to become a church, a house of prayer, not just with prayer. And I believe God's answering our prayers. So church, let me just give this as a testimony before we get into this. You know, God met us so powerfully this weekend, but I rewind to Wednesday night before the weekend when we spent time, 10 or 15 minutes of our weekly prayer meeting. Yeah, he's talking about the prayer meeting again. I'm going to talk about the prayer meeting again because it's in that place that God seeded what happened on Friday night. It was in that place we prayed in. The men came forward. They were a part of that. So Corey, some of you remember, we stood there at that altar. God, meet us with your power. Pour out your presence. And guess what? He did it. And then we stand there at the end wondering, well, what happened? I wonder what made that so different. It's because when we pray, God answers us. There's a reason to when we pray, church, and there's a reason that we gather. And when we gather and we come into agreement, Jesus says, if you touch this one thing, if you say it, if you come into agreement, if you pray and seek it, it will happen. And we saw it happen this weekend, church. So I want to encourage you, be here on Wednesday night. Come to the prayer meeting. Come and press in because God is answering our prayers. We feel that God is meeting us and in his presence there's amazing things happening. And we prayed something on Wednesday that I saw the fulfillment of on, on Friday. Praise God. Praise God. So come and join us on, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, Wednesdays isn't just for children here at Evangel Church. We have a few hundred people gathering every Wednesday night to seek the face of God in prayer. And he's meeting us in a special way. That was extra. That wasn't a part of the message today. That was just for you. Um, but let's, uh, let's come to God's word this morning. I just have a message the Lord has put on my heart called the power of connection. And I have a question I'm asking you today. Who's in your circle? You know, there's a statement that I grew up hearing a lot as a child. And I understood the importance. It sounded a lot like a cliche. You may have said it to your friends or heard it said in some circle somewhere. But I'm going to tell it to you this morning because it's a, a very real principle that's going to guide us into the word that God has for us this morning. If you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Do you know that your friends, the friendships, the relationships in your life, whether you realize it or not, they are carrying you somewhere? They are bringing you somewhere. They're taking you somewhere. And the question is, is do you know where they're taking you? And do you like where they're taking you? Because they're taking you somewhere. Every single one of us. You have relationships that are pulling you in different places. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. I want to tell you, I am the byproduct of what I will call a series of providential relationships in my life. There are a series of people that God brought into my life before I even knew him that were a part of guiding me towards him. Do you know that God will put people in your life that know him, that love him, and the part of their purpose is to help you get closer to him? Is that they will, he will use relationships in your life, people that love the Lord, people that pray, people that seek him, and part of those relationships are providential relationships that God will use for his purposes to guide you towards himself. You might be sitting next to someone like that. They were a providential relationship. Yes, it's great that you know them. Yes, it's great that you're married to them. Yes, it's great that, that, that you're, you're friends with them. But when you sit back and think about it, you're like, it's because of you that I know Jesus today. 
God used you to bring me to Jesus. Is there anyone in the room today that can say that? Is there anyone in the room that you know you're the byproduct of someone that leaned in, someone that, that saw, someone that loved you and cared about you enough to help you get to Jesus? So I want to tell you, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. I had a friend who cared about me enough to tell me about Jesus, to help me grow closer to him. But guess what? I had another group of friends at that same exact time, and they were going the complete opposite direction. They were getting involved in drugs and drinking and all kinds of things. And here I am, kind of one foot in both of these circles, and I had to make a decision. This friendship is going to take me this way. This one's taking me this way. Which one do I choose? Does anyone ever live in those tensions? Where am I going? And I made a decision that changed my life forever. I stepped this way. You know what's sobering to think about? There are some people that over here in this circle, they're not alive anymore. They're like 31 years old. They died when they were like 26 of drug overdoses. The people that I know, people I can, I can start naming names of people that were in that circle sitting, even at that lunch table in my middle school, they're not alive anymore. They got into a circle that just kind of spiraled out of control. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. It's shaped by these kinds of relationships. But I want you to know, if you can get into some relationships, if you can have some friendships, if you have a circle that's drawing you closer to God, watch out. Because there's transformation waiting at the other side of that. There's something powerful that can happen whenever you have a group of people around you that are leading you towards the right things, towards the purposes of God, towards a relationship with Jesus. It'll change your life forever. Thank you, Asha. I wish someone else would agree with me this morning. You got to see it this morning. You got to see it this morning. Because I'm telling you, God works in the midst of these relationships like you would never, ever imagine. The people around you, I want you to know the closest people to you are carrying you somewhere. Where are they carrying you today? I want to I paint three pictures for you. The first one, and if you have your notes, write it down here. It's in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we come across someone who needs to be carried somewhere. He's hit with something in his life that, he, that, that has taken away his hope, that has taken away his peace, that has robbed him of his joy. In fact, he's paralyzed and he can't even walk and he's living his entire life like that. He has to rely on others. And every day, they would pick him up and they would carry him somewhere. The people around you, the people closest to you, they're carrying you somewhere. And they carried him, they picked him up, and they led him. And they set him by a pool called the Pool of Bethesda. Pastor Rick and I got to see that pool in Israel. It's still there, the ruins of it at least. I don't know if we have a picture of it here we could throw up. But this pool is a place where people used to gather. And there were many lame, many that couldn't walk, many that were paralyzed and had all kinds of different ailments. And they would lay by this pool all day. And this pool was fed by a natural spring. And whenever the spring would come and it would, it would be feeding it with water, it would start to kind of bubble up a little bit. And people thought there was a kind of a belief that there was an angel that came and kind of stirred the waters because the waters were moving. And so they would say that they believe the first person to get in the waters after that stirring happened, they would be healed of whatever it is that they were going through. And so you just have all these people, all these people with all these ailments just there at the pool and they're just hoping that they can get in. And the Bible says that this man, for his entire life, for like 38 years, is just being taken and placed down by this pool. Now think about this. There are people in his life that are carrying him and placing him there every single day. But man, what is that helping, really? What is that doing? Placing him here. Here's what the Bible says. He tells Jesus, whenever the water is stirred, there is no one there to help me get in. So evidently, they're dropping him off and leaving every single day. And by the time the waters actually come, they don't have time to actually help him get to that place, but they're doing enough good. There are people in your life that you may feel, oh, they're good friends. They're good friends. They're good. They're going to... But I want to tell you, those kind of relationships can only get you so far, they can't get you to the point of transformation. They can only get you there, but they'll always come short. Now go over to Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, the Bible says that Peter and John, they're walking towards the place of prayer. And as they're walking towards the place of prayer, at the time of prayer, they're walking to the temple. And as they're going there, it says there was a man being carried along 
who was paralyzed as well. He was lame and he couldn't walk. And it says they would place him every day right there at the gate called Beautiful and they'd place him there and he'd beg for money from the people that were passing by. The people closest to you, they're carrying you somewhere. You might be able to walk just fine. You may feel like, you know, no, I'm good. I can go wherever I want. No, the relationships in your life, they're carrying you just like we're talking about here. They're taking you somewhere. They place him there. Some of you say, I have relationships in my life, man. I have a friend. I could call him at any time. I have people in my life. If I need anything, if I need money, if I need provision, I need something, man, I know I can always call him. I want you to, that will only go so far. That doesn't address the real need. The need is for transformation. That man didn't need another, another few alms. He didn't need a couple more dollars. He needed to be able to leap for joy one day again because something had been taken from him. He was bound up. He was stuck. He was there. Some of us, men, we're living our lives and we're stuck. We're stuck in the same place. And guess what? The relationships in our lives are close. They just brought us there and no further. And there we are just kind of stuck in whatever place that is. I want you to know that the people closest to you are taking you somewhere. For some of you, you're sitting by a gate and maybe you have what you need. Maybe you, you have the provision. You have those things figured out. Others, you, you, you have something, but we all have something in us. There's a deep need for transformation that only God can provide. What's amazing to me is that Jesus shows up at the pool of Bethesda. The Bible doesn't talk about any of this person's friends being around. So they brought him to the pool, but they weren't people that necessarily brought him towards Jesus. This man that's by the gate, beautiful in Acts chapter 3, we know how long he had been there, such a long period of time. We know from the timing of the scriptures that Jesus himself, if he, as he went to the temple, we know he went to the temple. The Bible talks about that regularly. As a Jewish man, he went in and out of the temple. He passed by this guy regularly. He would have passed by him. But there he was that entire time, that entire season till the book of Acts, waiting, waiting, waiting. It sets the stage for one other story that I want to share with you. One other circumstance so different. Go with me now to Luke chapter 5. Turn with me to Luke chapter 5, it's right before the Gospel of John. And in Luke chapter 5, we come across another man who is paralyzed, another man who is lame, another man who cannot walk, He is paralyzed in his body. But something different is happening in this story. Something so different that's about to bring about lasting transformation. In Luke chapter 5, it says this, that one day Jesus was teaching. There were some Pharisees, some teachers of the law sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. So we see that Jesus is in this place, and as he's there, all the people have gathered around him. And I've been to Israel before, and I've seen uh, kind of replicas of some of the houses that would have been built in that place, in that very region that we're talking about. And as you look there, these are not very large rooms. Even a synagogue itself is not very big. You remember, Pastor Rick, it's not as big as... uh, a third of this room, uh, even, ha- uh, even more than that, it's, they're, they're kind of small and intimate gathering places, even the largest spaces. But he wasn't in a synagogue. He was in probably some kind of house, some kind of home right there in that region. These are normally like 15 by 15, maybe 20 by 20. That's a, that's a large space. Jesus is in the middle of that place. And all the people have pressed in. And the Bible says in verse 18, and some men... We're carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of Jesus. There's a group of people. I want you to know the people around you are carrying you somewhere. Where are they bringing you? This is a group of people. This is a circle that has surrounded this man and their goal, their intention, their mission is to get him into the presence of Jesus. I want to tell you this. You need a group of people around you that are willing to carry you into the presence of Jesus, that are willing to bring you into the presence of Jesus when nothing else will do. Do you have people around you? What does your circle look like today? 
Where are the relationships in your life carrying you? Because I want you to know that something transformational is about to happen because there's a group of people that have fixed it in their hearts and in their minds to get this man into the presence of Jesus. We're not going to set him by another gate. We're not going to go set him by the pool. We want to get him straight to the feet of Jesus because nothing else will do. I want to tell you, when you get people in your life that think that way, when you surround yourself with a community of faith that thinks that way, then guess what? Your life changes forever. Your story gets rewritten. You don't, you're not who you used to be. Your life changes and grows in ways you could never imagine. Talk about providential relationships. And so these men, they're just fixed on this. They fixed on wanting to get him to Jesus. And there's something that I see here. I see a caring. I see a compassion that fills them, that makes them want to go that extra mile. And so they're saying, you know what? We want to get him to Jesus. Now, everyone's pressed in. Where I see the gate, where I see Bethesda, well, there's a bunch of people by the pool. Let's just set them down here. Here is good enough. Here is good enough. You need people around you that don't settle for good enough. They want to get, they want to press in. They want to get there. There's a perseverance in them. This is what we see in the heart of this group that's surrounding this one man. They cared more than others thought was necessary. They gave more than others thought was practical. Verse 19, it says, not finding any way to bring him in. They couldn't get into the house, so they went up over the house. I mean, think about this for just a minute. They can't get into him, and so they went up on the roof, and they let him down on a stretcher. They literally take the roof off to get this man to Jesus. And as you see this happening, you see them pulling. You probably see some dirt falling down. You see them pulling the tiles back, getting them to that place. And as they're doing that, they begin to lower him down right into the presence of Jesus. I talked to the men last night at the retreat about this. I said, man, we need one another. You need people around you. Man, we can live so isolated. You want to know one of the most powerful things to see last night was? Was see men in groups of three, four, five, six, standing around, and one man would just step into the middle, and they would just share whatever was on their heart. They would just open up their heart, whatever it was. And the men around them said, now let's carry you to Jesus. And they lay hands on them, and they prayed for them. They ministered. These men wept in the presence of God. Come on, real men weep for Jesus, man. I'm telling you that. They just, it, it, but there was breakthrough because there was a group of men that were willing to carry one another to Jesus. Lasting transformation happens if we can get this principle into our hearts. How far will you go to get there? How far will you go to, to help others reach that place that only God can meet them? And so we see this happen in verse 19. They couldn't find any other way. They were willing to go above and beyond. They overcame the cants. They overcame the closed doors. They went past the crowds, the obstacles, even the religious people that were in the room. Because sometimes even the religious people can get in the way of what God is trying to do. It can happen. It happened here. And they begin to lower him down. I'm sure. I mean, it's like they're risking everything in this moment. They're like kind of risking it all. But they just want to get him down there in front of Jesus. And if I could just see this moment in time, just willing to go this mile, I want you to know, there, I, I know there are some people in my life, they went, they went the extra mile. I had, I had friends that whenever I was growing up, my mom was working extra jobs. We didn't even have a car. I got saved, and I couldn't get to church. So I had friends that would drive like 20, 30 minutes out of the way, their families. And I could feel it was like a little strain on them. And it was hard for them to sustain it at times with them working and all that other stuff. But they'd pick me up because they knew Chris just got saved. We don't know what's going to happen if we don't continue getting him to church. They went the extra mile. They did more than what was practical because they wanted me to just be in the presence of Jesus. I think I'm here today because of those kinds of decisions that people made. Are you with me? That may sound insignificant to you. It was really significant now that I'm thinking about it because someone went the extra mile. I'm not talking about you going and ripping the roof off of someone's house feeling like well if I don't do that but are you willing to do these extra things maybe more than seems practical things that seem maybe inconvenient at times because you're committed to getting someone to Jesus 
You know, I've talked about this passage. I preached this passage before. You may have heard me talk about this passage, and I always will talk about the idea, how far will you go to carry one person to Jesus? And I'm thinking, that's not necessarily really what's going on here. It's not me picking up one person and carrying them to Jesus. It's a circle of people carrying someone to Jesus. It doesn't say a man brought a man and lowered. It says a group brought a man and lowered him. I want you to know we're not islands unto ourselves. God's made us for community. We need to be connected to others, not another one others and there's something powerful that happens in the midst of that community here's a term that i've heard used and i've only heard it in like one context but i loved it it's this latin word called communitas communitas is different than community community is like this harmony and this connection and this fellowship communitas is the community that's formed in the midst of adversity or a shared struggle communitas is powerful Communitas, the, the best illustration of it that I can give you, happened in a, in a wedding that I was performing. This was one of the most special weddings that I could remember of all the weddings that I've performed here at Evangel. And it was the oldest couple that I ever married. I won't tell you how old they, they, they were, but they were in their retirement years, and they'd fallen in love with one another, and they were just ready to spend the rest of their life that they had left together. And so we went through the premarital process. It was amazing to watch a couple at that age looking like little school children, man, just so giddy for each other, just so excited for, for this, so in love with each other. And so we're, it was just such a unique wedding. And I thought, this is unique. This is very, very unique. I don't know if I'll ever perform a wedding quite like this. And then we came to the day of, and we're here at Evangel. And every kind of wedding that we perform here, I'll normally be right behind this door uh, with, the, with the groom and with the groomsmen. And he had three people. One was his brother, and the other two were two friends. I stood back there, and let me tell you, church, I've never been a part of a wedding where there was a group of groomsmen that were that connected to the groom. I've never, I've never experienced this before. I'll see people, they'll be their best friends, college roommates, brothers, family. There can be a lot of love. There could be a lot of joking. There could be a lot of nerves. There could be a lot of whatever going on there. But I witnessed something when I stood in this group. I walked into it and I felt, I could feel it. I could feel the presence of something unique and different. I could see a love in their eyes for one another that I just hadn't seen before. And I said, how do you guys know each other? And they just looked at each other, and then they just started crying. Tears filled their eyes. He began to, the groom began to say to me, he said, oh, we've been through it. We've known each other 55 years. These two men here served in Vietnam with me. We carried each other. And I just thought, I don't even know what community is. <laughs> like, I live in, no, like this right here. I, I prayed that day, and I prayed again today, and I say to my own heart, Lord, 50 years from now, put people in my life that I could stand and get in tears in my eyes as I, as, I, as I think about them, as I talk. Lord, would you put some people in the trenches with me to walk this journey of life together that I could stand and say, we've been through the journey. We've carried one another. We've bled on one another. We've done whatever we can. We've walked this out. I want you to know there's something powerful. Soon as I said, soon as I said Vietnam, did you hear the room? Because there's a struggle. You felt that, didn't you? You felt that there's a shared adversity that overcame that. I want you to know the Bible says you and I are in a battle. It's not one against flesh and blood, but I want you to know it's a battle. It's a real battle. It's a spiritual battle. And in the same way, God wants to forge relationships in your life that when the battle is waging, you pick one another up and carry each other forward. Help one another get to where God has for you to be. God works powerfully in the midst of these kinds of providential relationships. This is what's happening in our midst. As we kind of see this man lowered down in front of Jesus, here's what the Bible says. I love verse 20. I love verse 20 of Luke chapter 5. It says, seeing their faith. Come on, Pastor Rick, you can come on up. Seeing their faith. Whose faith? Whose faith are we talking about? The friends. The faith of the friends. The faith of the people around. Them. The faith of the circle. Not the faith of the man in the midst, middle of the circle. Man, if there, is a better, if there isn't a better verse for intercessory prayer, why we get together on Wednesday nights, I don't know what it is, seeing their faith. I want you to know, when we pray on Wednesday nights, here's what's happening. God's looking down. Seeing their faith, he's moving on their behalf. 
Seeing their faith, he's moving mountains over here. Seeing their faith, he's reaching out to Kentucky and setting someone free of addiction. Seeing their faith, he's healing someone laid up in a hospital bed across the state. Seeing their faith, that's what happens right here. Jesus is one who rewards and honors faith as we come to him, as we trust him, as we lean into him. Seeing their faith, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith, Jesus had the power to heal and restore this man in this very moment. And the, the religious people do what the religious people do. And they start questioning, well, what does he mean? He forgives our sins. Like, we, how, how, what is that all about? Can God, God alone forgive sin? Jesus sees what they're thinking. Their heart says, cut it out. Like, what's easier for me to see your sins are forgiven or take up your mountain walk? Son, take up your mountain walk. And the Bible says in verse 25, it says, immediately he got up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. This is what happens when we encounter Jesus. This is what happens when we come to him. I want you to know you need these kind of people in your life, someone that's willing to come around you because I want you, when the storms of life come, it's not then that you start looking around saying, man, let me find some friends. It's long before that that God forged something here. They saw something. The Bible doesn't give us enough detail to fully understand. I wish we could the depths of what led them to this moment in time that made them able and willing to go the extra mile to not just leave him outside the door, to not just lay him somewhere that seemed to be okay and practical, but to go to great lengths to bring him into the presence of Jesus. Friends, I want to be a part of relationships like that. I want to be a part of a circle like that, that no matter who's going through the trial, one day it might be me, but the next day it might be someone else. In the same way they carried me, I'm willing to carry them because we're getting to Jesus. He's the only one who has an answer. So I ask you again today, who's in your circle? Who do you have around you that's helping you in this way, that's leading you towards Jesus, whose influence in your life is pointing you towards Christ? Because when this happens, there's something in that unity. You don't just need one. You You need a circle of people around you. Because there can be a storm that comes and and a few people are swept up in the midst of it. And guess what? There's a group that rallies around you. There's a group that stands with you. There's a group that comes alongside of you. I'm not looking for good people. You might have good people in your life. And that's good. But I'm talking about godly people in your life. Because I want you to know, you might say, well, I got someone you don't understand, Pastor. He doesn't really know Jesus. But man, he's a good man. Praise God, he's a good man. He would even take a bullet for me. Well, that's great, but the enemy's firing a lot of bullets. He takes the one bullet. Now you're vulnerable over here. You don't need someone that can just take a bullet. You need someone that can raise the dead. You need someone who has the power to restore, to heal, to protect you, to put a hedge around you. You need the one who has a, no, Pastor, you don't understand. I got people in my life. I mean, like, they could give me anything I need money-wise. Like, I mean, they got more zeros in their back. That's great. I'm glad they have that. But I'm talking about someone who knows the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the God who provides in every circumstance. I'm talking about the God who can do immeasurably more. You need to be connected to people who are connected to him, that are looking to him, that are helping to guide you in that way. And I'm telling you, the more you surround yourself in those kinds of circles, the more that God begins to move and transform your life. Some of you mean you're sitting by a gate. You're here on Sundays, but every other day you're sitting by a gate and you're just barely getting by. And I want you to know church isn't meant to be just a Sunday activity. Church is a group of people that carry one another to Jesus. It's a caring community of faith that believes big in what God can do and are willing to help one another on the journey towards Jesus. That's what church really is. Church isn't about the service. There's nothing in the Bible about pews or about lights or about screens or about songs. It's about this idea of the body of Christ being a group of people that come together to lift up the name of Jesus. They just, that, that's what it's about. It's about being the body caring for one another, loving one another, serving one another, praying for one another, exhorting one another, studying the scriptures together, lifting up those songs of praise to God in one voice, waiting on him and his power. That's the church. And when you're part of a circle like that, guess what? We're two or more gathered. He's right there with you. You have church right together, right in those moments that you're willing to gather together with others and be together and be the body of Christ. In Acts 2.42, it says they committed themselves, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
and everyone was filled with awe and the supernatural move of God was happening all around them. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. God was doing that. That's the power of what we're talking about today. Who is in your circle? Who are you connected to today? Church, I want you to become more connected. In this season, it calls us to greater levels of connection. Not just coming here on a Sunday morning, but truly finding a group of others that you can connect with and just explore life and walk a journey with for a season. That's what we're leaning into. That's what we believe will change everything in your life. And we want you to be a part of that. The best way for you to be a part of that is being a part of one of our communities, one of our small groups that get together outside of Sunday morning. Sunday is not enough. Sunday is where you attend. I'm talking about connection now. I'm talking about getting connected beyond Sunday into a smaller place that you can truly begin to grow in your relationship with God and grow in relationship with others. That's what we need. And so we're about to launch into a brand new series and it's another opportunity for you to get connected. This is us. We have this guide, the series guide. I hope you'll pick that up. It's one of the ways for you to connect with what God's going to be uh, leading us through and, and what God has to say to us in the midst of this series through devotionals, all these things. You could pick those up out in the foyer. But there are small groups that go along with this and there's a small group curriculum in there. And one of the best ways for you to be connected is to get engaged in a group. And so here's what I want every person to do. Go into your bulletin right now and pull out this one form, this small group form. Come on. I want every person to be holding it in your hand at least. Even if you came here today and weren't planning on filling it out, just take it in your hand because I asked you to, please. And I'm going to pray in just a moment. I want you to pray as well because you need to take what we've just talked about very seriously. And I believe that this one step here for someone that is not as connected as you should be, is a great way for you to take a first step to apply what we've been talking about this morning to get into a circle that can carry one another towards Jesus. So I want you to take this in your hand and there are a few ways that you can take a first step today to get more connected and to get into a circle. You're going to see there are three right here. It says we're inspired in rows, but we grow in circles. It's in these circles that we begin to grow and really begin to walk out our faith and our, in our relationship with God. And there are three ways for you to do this. The first one is this. Are you willing to open your home? Say, Pastor, I, I can't lead a small group. Says, and lead a group. That sounds intimidating. Just put your finger over and lead a group. Are you willing to open your home? That's, that's really the majority of it is are you willing? Here's what I realized. Luke 15 doesn't, or Luke 5 doesn't happen if someone didn't open their home. And guess what? Who opened their home in Luke 5? We don't know. It doesn't matter. But guess what happened in that home? A miracle. I want you to know, some of you, you're just one decision. It's like just one willingness to open your home. And guess what? We might see Luke 5 happening in your very midst. That God's going to use that to save someone's life, to change someone's life, to bring about a relationship that leads to transformation. But are you willing to open up? Well, pastor, you know, I don't, I don't teach the Bible. I, I, I don't know how all that will go. This is what's great about the This Is Us series. You have the book. All the questions are already in there. Someone in the group can help, you know, you guys facilitate that. We teach it on video. So you have a video. All you need to do is just put the DVD in the DVD player, press play, or you will give you a link. You could watch it on the computer with your friends, whatever it is. Are you willing to just open up your home? If you're willing to do that, then open up. There are people that are here that that are looking for a group still, and, and it might be yours that they're going to connect, and it might be there that God sparks one of these relationships that we've been talking about today. The second one, I think many might connect with this one, is are you willing just to gather with others? This is a way of just kind of forming your own group, just forming a group with your family, extended family, friends, people around you. You're like, you know, I do know some people that love Jesus or are on a journey with him, Maybe they're not growing as much as they should, but I'm willing to take this journey and, and gather with them and just form a group ourselves. Maybe two, maybe three, maybe five people. It doesn't need to be a lot, but just enough where you have a circle and you guys can begin to walk this out. And if you're willing to form your own group and grow, there's a great way for you to do that. Just think about this, write this in your notes. Grow, G-R-O-W. This is how you can do the second step here in this if you want to just open your calendar and gather with others. To grow means this. You're going to grab the book. You're going to grab one or more copies of this book. That's G. Grab the book. Got it? G. R is you're going to recruit some friends. Call a few people. 
Connect with a few people. Say, hey, you know what? I want, I, want, I want to have a circle. I want you to be a part of that. I want us to grow together. Will you take this journey with me? Let's meet at a coffee shop. Let's meet at a cafe. Let's meet for lunch. Whatever it is, we'll open our schedule. So G is grab the resource, grab the book. R is recruit some friends. O is open your calendar. Make a priority to get into a circle. I'm telling you, when the storms come, that's not the time to start looking for the friends. It's to lean into the friends that you've been developing, the relationships, the circle that you've been intentional to grow in. So that's O, open your calendar. W is walk with another. Walk a journey for seven weeks with someone else, with a small group of people, and watch what God does as a result of it. Amen? So that's the second one. The third one is that you're willing to just join a group. And we have almost 20 groups on the back of this handout, all different times of the week, different places. We had more people in last service that filled out, and we'll let you know about those next week that are willing to open their homes. But just check off, let us know which group you'd like to be a part of, and join a group. So one of those things, open your home to host one, gather with some friends, or join a group and and continue to grow and live out what God has for us. Amen? Would you stand to your feet this morning? I'm going to pray. I want you to begin to fill that out uh, as we close today. We're going to have ushers at every door that are going to be there and just hand this to them as you filled it out. We'll collect those all from you so that we can process them. And uh, also you could stop, you could drop it off as you're picking up your books on the way out. They're out at both of the uh, information tables out in the foyer. But we're going to pray right now. But I want to pray for some people that are in the room right now. And if you're here, just for a moment, just bow your heads and close your eyes with me right now. But I just want to, I need to pray for those of you that feel as I preach this message, I don't know that I have enough people that are around me. I need, I need a circle like you've been talking about, Pastor. I don't, I don't think that the circle around me has been carrying me where Jesus wants me. And I, and I need, I just want, I want God's help. Lord, I'm, I'm reaching out and I just, I, I want to grow in this way. I want to have people around me that are leading me towards Jesus. And I just want to see who's here that's in that place because I do want to pray that God would bring those people around you, okay? That's the reason I'm asking you to do this. And I, and I just want you just to acknowledge it before the Lord today. I need that. So if that's you right now, as I'm about to pray, just lift your hand up and just wave at me if that's you. I want to pray for you. Come on, I see you raising your hands right now. Praise God. Praise God. There's many hands that are going up. Don't feel shy to do that. But I see people all around this room that are saying, I, I acknowledge the need for this in my own life. And now I want to just begin to pray for you right now. Come on, let's just call upon the Lord in these last moments. Let's ask him to send and to allow us to be those people that carry others to Jesus. Lord, we call upon you today. We thank you, Lord God, that you hear us. We thank you for miracles, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that what you do in the power of community is so transformative. And Lord God, I pray today, Lord God, that you lead us into these kinds of relationships. That, Lord God, we carry one another to Jesus when needed. That we encourage one another. We spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And Lord, we see the power of your transformation as a result. Lord, I pray for every person that's lifted their hands before you today. Lord, they've acknowledged their need for you. They've acknowledged their need for this kind of community in their lives. I pray that you would stretch them and grow them in this season. I pray against fear, discouragement, and distraction, Lord God. I pray you'll give them, Lord God, people in their path that will help them to move closer and closer to you. Lord God, we thank you for it. We pray that you lead us now. And Lord, we pray for this to be a season of connection, like we haven't seen before, where we see and experience your presence in a powerful way. And God, we ask you to send us forth from this place full of your presence, Lord, full of the freedom that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Today, you're free to go if you need to to head out. Again, we have new to you happening. If you're new to Evangel, stop over in the overflow. We'd love to have lunch with you and tell you about the church. Uh, If you need prayer, feel free to come to this altar. We're going to have a few of our pastors and prayer team available. If I could have a few of our prayer team members come forward, and we'll be present here to pray with you if you need. God bless.